Welcome, everybody, to the Very Connected Podcast. We're excited to have you guys. It's our March support group, and we are being joined by Rodolfo Alvarez, one of my oh dearest colleagues. Rodolfo, you know I just love you. And <laughs> if you guys have been on these before, you've met him, but he is, he's very unique, like his background and um, style. He is a coach and he has a background. He's from, I hope I'm going to say it right. Is it Chile? Is that how, am I saying it right? Chile, Chile you're right. Okay. <laughs> you have a little bit different way of saying it. That sounds a lot more authentic. Um, but he's traveled all over the world, including Mexico, Canada, the U.S., and just helping patients um, and programs develop different programs for clients. So at that, our topic too, I want to just kind of bring in is taming cravings, head hunger, and emotional eating after bariatric surgery. And we'll kind of get deeper into that. But before I do, Rodolfo, I'm just going to turn the, the screen over to you for a moment and kind of let us know a little bit more in depth about you and and everybody that's joining i want to welcome you all with open arms we're so happy you're here and thank you for all the warm welcomes it looks like we have a lot of people saying hello let us know where you're from i see someone's from california <clears throat> i know we usually have people joining from all over the u.s u.s and sometimes we even have some outstretched from um from other from other areas. So with that, Rodolfo, I'm going to turn turn it over to you for a moment. Excellent. Thank you, Brenda. Um, so yes, before starting and sharing about my background, my story, I would like to encourage you to introduce yourself by the chat. You can share with us your location, maybe when you had surgery. I would like to say welcome to this workshop, with, to this support group. As Brenda was saying, today we will talk about taming cravings, head hunger, emotional eating after bariatric surgery. And I would like to share a little about my background. I'm from Chile. Since the year 2015, I've been supporting individuals in their weight loss journeys. I was an engineer. I worked as a consultant. But when I was doing that, I noticed that that wasn't my passion. I wanted to help others. I got coaching certifications, and then I designed a program in which I taught tools to people losing weight uh, to make the change and the transformation sustainable. In my country, when people wanted to lose weight, the classic solution were diets. But I felt in that moment that nobody was taking care of the mental part, the mindset. And my program focused on emotion management, uh, also, we provided tools to transform habits. And what I would like to do today is to share some of the most powerful tools that I've seen that help people to make their journeys and transformation sustainable. Okay? I'm excited for being here. This is going to be kind of like a workshop. So I would like to encourage you to have a notebook, a pen to take notes, because actually you will learn tools that will help you uh, after the class. Okay? My idea is for you to learn here. If you have questions, ask questions. If you need me to repeat something, please let me know. I will be glad to do that because my purpose today is to give you clarity and also providing tools that will help you. So take all the notes that you need because today we'll talk about emotions, habits, how to transform them. Also, you will learn different techniques, etc. That's going to be today's class. Well, and Rodolfo, you, <clears throat> the things that you share are powerful because what happens is, is we get out there in life and we walk day to day in our shoes. And sometimes we have these, I'm going to call them habits or things that happen and they just kind of like loop in our brains. And it's sometimes it's kind of hard just to stop and to start new. You know, when we want to start a new, whatever it is, like transform something, Having a little tool or having something else besides just our surgery, because the surgery is a big help, not going to lie about that, but it is definitely good to have some other little tools in our toolbox to kind of navigate, you know, the mindset part, because we all have grown up around different belief systems and, and different ways of thinking. And sometimes, sometimes it's helpful just to have somebody new and it can be life-changing you know if you get to the root of whatever it is you're no longer triggered by that same thing over and over and over again so thank you 
Uh, yeah, and one of the things that I have noticed that help patients, Brenda, is to have tools that have clear steps that they can follow. It's kind of like I'm experiencing anxiety. I need to follow a step one, two, and three. And I think that that's linked to my background, right? And I love to provide those type of tools. So my idea is to give you some structure, actually, that you will be able to use in the future that will help you to manage emotional eating, cravings, um, and head hunger. That's the purpose of this class. So, Wonderful. Well, let's get started. You think? Are you ready to dive in? Yes. Okay, let's yes. start. So um, about me, I would like to share that I haven't had bariatric surgery, but since I was a kid, I struggled with my weight. And I'm convinced that when you have an attachment to food, this is a work that you will have to do forever. What do I mean with this? If, in my case, for example, I covered anxiety with food, that's a tendency. And that's going to be inside of me. So I need to know and be aware. And when anxiety emerges, use other tools to manage this emotion. Okay? That's one of the things that I wanted to share before starting about me. Now, let's begin with some fundamentals, okay? And the first concept that I would like to introduce today is the concept of habits. So when we're talking about habits, we're talking about behaviors, about actions that we perform unconsciously. What do I mean with this? For example, imagine that you go to the grocery store, you are walking through a specific aisle, and then you take a product and you put it inside of your cart. And you don't check the price. You don't think like if you would like to have this this time or not. No, you just put it inside of the cart. If you do that without thinking, without making a decision process, we will say that that's a habit. Okay? If you stopped, checked the price, checked the product, the item, and then you were like, hmm, I, I want to take this home with me today that's not going to be a habit. Habits are actions that we perform unconsciously. And we might have different types of habits. For example, some people before going to bed at nighttime read, and that could be a habit. Others, for example, when they experience anxiety, they eat something and turn to food. They might eat something sweet, right? That could be a habit too. For other people, they wake up in the morning and then they work out. And for them, that's could be a habit, right? Others, for example, smoke, and that could be a habit. Maybe when some people are bored uh, at home, they don't know what to do, they turn to social media. They start watching videos, or maybe they start watching Netflix, okay? So when we repeat an action consistently in the long run, and this action is an action that we associate with pleasure and provide us with a reward, then that action it's likely to turn into a habit. And what I would like to do now is kind of share with you an experiment that some scientists did in the past to understand how habits work. And actually this experiment consists of a rat that is inside of a maze. And there's a gate which has color blue, okay? And what the scientists did was to open the gate and check what happened with the behavior of the rat. So the first times the rat perceived the smell of the cheese and the rat started running inside of this maze. And maybe the first times the rat went down because it couldn't see the cheese, right? But then went up and then ultimately found the cheese. And the cheese was a reward for this rat. After a specific number of repetitions, the scientists noticed that the rat went immediately up, immediately. And the rat started not thinking about where to go. It was a process performed automatically. In that moment, we will say that the rat built a habit. And if you notice, the process has three stages. First, there's a gate that is opened, which we are going to call a trigger okay, or a signal. Then the rat runs through the maze, which is going to be the routine or the action. And then the rat will get the reward, the cheese, the gratification, okay? And those are the three stages of each or every habit, habit, okay? There's always a trigger, a routine, and a reward. 
So for example, let's say that I struggle with emotional eating. Maybe I experience anxiety and when I'm anxious, I tend to turn to food. My trigger will be anxiety. What do I do after is start eating. That will be the routine. And then after that, my brain is going to feel better. I'm going to start experiencing a sense of comfort, okay? Um, when we eat, when we're experiencing tough emotions, what happens is that we are able to disconnect from the emotion. We're able to soothe from the emotion. And that's a reward. Because if the emotion was painful, then the pain that we will experience after eating will be less. Now, that doesn't last so long because then guilt, shame, and other emotions might emerge, which might be triggers, and then we continue eating again. So it's kind of like a vicious cycle. What's interesting about this structure, that as long you have a craving and you are getting pleasure and you are repeating a specific action, you will build a new habit. Some people tell me, you know what, Rodolfo, I would like to work out, I would like to go to the gym, and I have done that for three months in a row, and then I stop doing it. It's not a habit. And what I ask them is the following. When you were going to the gym, were you enjoying the experience? And they tell me, no, you know what? I wasn't enjoying it. Actually, it was painful. Okay. So if your brain is not enjoying and there's no craving, <laughs> then you will not build the habit. So in order to build a new habit, what you have to do is to enjoy the process. That's one of the keys that I wanted to share today with you. Now, in terms of the bariatric journey, why this is important? Because maybe you had surgery, you were in the first stage, maybe the honeymoon, right? And maybe for you at the beginning, you were able to stick to your habits. And then you were seeing progress, you were motivated, you were empowered, etc. You built new habits and then you were able to stick to your plan. And that maybe lasted for months, six months, seven months. But let's say that then the capacity of your stomach starts increasing and then you start having some sweets at nighttime. And you do that one day, two days, three days. If you repeat this sequence and you have a craving and your brain is enjoying, then you're going to build new habits. So the habits that you build after surgery are habits that can be transformed. And then you can build a new habit related to emotional eating, which will make you, for example, in the future, and it's not man managed, um, make you regain the weight that you lost. So why this is important? Because we need to be aware of this process, which is happening all the time. We're constantly building new habits, transforming our habits. And if we are not aware of that, they might build, we will not be conscious, and then after might be too late, which is what I've seen with some bariatric patients that experience regain. When they want to do something, they already build the habits that are not aligned with their goals. And then they have to start. Yes, but the interesting thing is that you can be aware from the beginning and start working on this from day zero. So I would like to check, and you can give me some feedback by the chat if you're following me. I would like to know. I really appreciate the engagement. So if you say yes, like that for me is going to be like a huge key because I love to know that people are at the other side of the screen. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, so remember, habits have three stages. There's a trigger, a routine, a reward. So for example, I wake up in the morning, I'm sleepy. I feel that I have a lack of energy. Then I have a coffee, that's my routine. After having the coffee, I feel energized, ready to start my day, which is a reward. So that's a habit, okay? Now, in terms of um, your bariatric journey, you will incorporate different habits. For example, the habit of having your vitamins or tracking your macros. And what I've seen a lot is that some people, for example, give themselves the permission to stop tracking for one day, two days. But then what happens is that they start building a new habit, which is the habit of not tracking. And then going back 
might be harder. So that's why this is important. Like maybe you are not thinking about a small action, but actually if you repeat this action every day, then you will start building in your brain a circuit and this is going to start happening automatically. Rodolfo, there was a there was a question a little way ways back, and since you're kind of talking about this cycle here, someone asked about um, after surgery, do patients start to crave again? I guess I'm I'm thinking that they're meaning have cravings. You know, does that happen? And I'd like your take on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that we as humans might have cravings, right? If we think what's a craving actually is our brain that was stimulized and then we're wanting to have an experience and cravings might emerge because for example, we're watching a video on social media and this video was something that looked delicious or maybe we started thinking about something that we ate in the past or maybe we're hungry and we started uh, thinking about different alternatives that we had. So cravings happen, right? The point here is what are we going to do with those cravings? And if I think about something and then I go to the kitchen and then I have that and I'm not hungry, for example, and it's not my meal time, my brain is going to get a reward. And it's likely that if I repeat the behavior, it's going to turn into a habit. So to answer that question, what I would say is that you might experience cravings after surgery. Maybe at the beginning, the intensity of those cravings were less, right? I think that what I've seen, right? And I don't like to like uh, share general patterns because I think that each journey is different. But what I've seen is that sometimes bariatric patients at the beginning are more motivated, right? Uh, the level of restriction is higher. So sometimes to stick to the habits is easier. That's what I've seen. And then with time, the capacity of their stomach increases. And with that, they are able to eat more. And with that, building new habits that are different to the ones that they had at the beginning. Does that make sense? I think, yes, their they're answering makes sense. And one thing that I think I want to add to that, if that if it's okay, is um, I, I feel like I know for myself, like I found whenever I am craving something, if I'm able to distance myself from it in some way and do that several times, like let's say I have a craving and I do it once and then I have that same craving again, do it again. What happens is, is I feel like that the energy that I'm being drawn into that habit or um, being responsive, if I stop being responsive to it, it's like I almost disconnect from it somewhat. And so it makes it easier. So the first couple of times might be, a little bit more uncomfortable just because you know that there was there was a reward involved but distancing yourself it's kind of like when you're smoke when you have a habit with smoking or drinking alcohol or um food food's no different but like not having that in your environment like not physically being able to see it or removing it from your environment like if it's in your cabinet moving it away from where you're not necessarily seeing it all the time. To me, those are really helpful things because it's kind of disconnecting it from like a distraction of some sort. Would you say that I, helps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's interesting what you're sharing, Brenda, because you're sharing uh, the techniques to transform habits that I teach in another class, which is specifically about habits. But I would like to make a little summary about the three techniques. The first one is to find alternative routines, right? So for example, if I'm experiencing anxiety and I'm using um, food to calm myself down, then what I can do is find an alternative routine that provides an experience, an experience of relaxation, for example, that helps me to calm myself down. That could be, for example, meditation or practicing a breathing technique, right? That's an alternative routine. Someone was sharing about uh, crochet or crocheting by the chat, which could be an alternative routine. That's one of the ways to transform your habits. Then another way is to eliminate the triggers. So for example, if I know that if I have in my pantry cookies and then I'm going to be tempted and have them, what I'm going to do is throw them away. Eliminating the trigger, okay? And then the third way is to create awareness and 
reduce the amount of pleasure that we associate with the reward. What do I mean with this? For example, I remember that I watched a documentary uh, called Fed Up, which explained the impact of sugar on the body, okay? And after that, eating sugar for me personally wasn't the same. It had like a different meaning. So that's another tool or technique that helps in those cases. Now, um, another technique that helps, if you are here in this call and you struggle with cravings, some of the most powerful techniques to manage craving are related to um, neural linguistics programming, okay? What do I mean with that? Um, when we have a craving, typically we are thinking about something, okay? So for example, I have a craving for having an ice cream and typically I'm visualizing a picture of an ice cream inside of my mind. And that ice cream might be, for example, a big one and it's colorful and I, this might be a sunny day, et cetera. All that perception is what is trigger, triggering uh, the desire to eat something and the craving. So in order to manage this craving, what you can do is to start shifting the way that you are perceiving that ice cream. For example, instead of watching the ice cream in color, you can watch it in black and white. Also, you can take that picture and maybe like look a small ice cream, a very, very tiny, small ice cream, right? Also, you can imagine that that ice cream is maybe melting. So if you start affecting the way that you perceive things, then the way that you feel and the craving is going to start being managed. And that's a really powerful technique because typically those processes happen and we're unconscious of them. So then we just want to have the ice cream and we go to the kitchen and we start eating, right? Instead of thinking about what we have inside of our mind and how we can play with that to reduce the craving or the desire that we are experiencing. Does that make sense? Yes, and Rodolfo, there was a couple questions. Um, what Could you name the three tools real quickly again and also yeah. the documentary? Okay, so the three, the three techniques to transform habits. The first one is to find an alternative routine. So basically finding something, an activity that gives me the reward, but it's not what I was doing. So instead of eating to manage anxiety, what I will do is to practice a breathing technique. That's the first one. The second one is eliminating the triggers. So if I know that if I have cookies, I will eat the cookies. I will not have cookies at home. That's eliminating a trigger. And the third one is creating awareness and decrease the pleasure that we associate with the habit or the routine. And the name of the documentary was Fed Up. It was a Netflix in the past. I don't know if now it's a Netflix, but it was. Yeah. So, um, Brenda, do you think that we are ready to move on to our next content? I think so. I think so. Perfect. Excellent. Let me ask our attendees. Are you ready to move on to our next content? Amelia, start practicing, please, the tool that I taught you. Start visualizing the ice cream dark, in black and white, melting, small. Because with that, you will be able to start managing uh, the level of craving and the desire that you have. Okay, awesome. So now I would like to talk a little about one of my favorite topics. I have a program on this topic, okay, which is emotional eating. Actually, I have a program called Taming Emotional Eating. And my purpose today is to teach you a method to manage emotional eating. That's the purpose, okay? And the first step is to distinguish between physical hunger and head hunger. So what's physical hunger? Physical hunger is a pain that we experience at the level of our stomach when we haven't eaten for hours, maybe four hours, five hours, six hours. Now, bariatric patients sometimes don't experience physical hunger for a while. Some of them start experiencing physical hunger one year after surgery, two years after surgery, etc. okay? So that's something that I need to tell you. Um, head hunger are all those times in which we eat without being hungry or without experiencing physical hunger, okay? So head hunger has different categories. 
one of the categories is emotional eating. So I'm experiencing anxiety, stress, anger, frustration, I'm tired, bored, etc. And then that's that feeling that it's uncomfortable. And what I do is to turn to food and eat something to disconnect from the emotion. That's what happens, okay? And that's emotional eating. Now, I've seen bariatric patients that experience shame and guilt because they struggle with emotional eating. And some of them thought that after surgery, they were not going to struggle with emotional eating. They understand that their weight was related to eating uh, driven by emotions. And they thought that after the surgery, that was going to be something easier to manage. And what I have to tell is the following. Eating, because you're experiencing emotions, is something related to not knowing how to regulate yourself. When I say not regulate yourself, that means you experience an emotion, and then you're able to regulate the intensity of the emotion and lower it. And that's a skill that we're supposed to learn when we are kids. But some people, and I will include myself in that group of people, don't learn that skill. And in society, I think that nobody teaches us how to regulate ourselves. Actually, that's something that is expected to be known, but nobody teaches us that, okay? So if today you're struggling with emotional eating, the first thing that I need to tell you is that probably you need to develop a skill that nobody taught you how to develop it, okay? And also, the other thing that I need to tell you is that it's a skill that people typically don't have. When people are experiencing an emotion, instead of connecting with the emotion, processing the emotion, and releasing it, what they, what they tend to do is to go in different ways, such as, for example, having arguments and fights, turning to social media and to their phones to disconnect, drinking something, eating something, so what I would say is that we live in a society that lots of times promote being disconnected from our emotions. And given that, we don't develop these skills, okay? So if you are there and you're struggling with emotional eating, don't worry, you just need to now learn this skill. And this is the moment to learn it, okay? Now, in terms of emotional eating, in terms of emotional eating and also physical hunger, I would like to share this table that shows some of the most common characteristics of each type of hunger, okay? So we have physical hunger and head hunger. So if you notice physical hunger, um, when you experience it, different alternatives of food can be fulfilling. In the case of head hunger, is food specific. So we're craving a cake, we're craving an ice cream, we're craving pasta, a hamburger, etc. okay? In the case of physical anger, it doesn't matter. Like whatever we eat is going to be okay. It could be beans, it doesn't matter. Then, physical hunger does not go away if you don't eat. In the case of head hunger, it can disappear suddenly. And it doesn't matter if you ate or not. Physical hunger intensifies with time if you don't eat. Head hunger starts suddenly from one moment to the other. So you're experiencing anxiety and it's like, I need to eat something, right? Then um, after eating for physical hunger, you don't have negative feelings because you know that you needed that food. In the case of head hunger, you experience guilt and shame because there's a part of you that knew that you were not hungry and that you didn't need that food. Um, in the case of physical hunger, it's over after you eat. And head hunger sometimes intensifies. And it happens what I told you after. You were experiencing, sorry, before. You were experiencing anxiety. You ate. Then maybe you felt better for a while. But then guilt and shame emerges. And those are emotions that are uncomfortable. And then there's, again, a tendency to turn to food to manage those new emotions. So it's kind of part of a vicious cycle, okay? Now, what I need you to start doing if you are struggling with emotional hunger is the following. Before eating, I want you to stop, count to 10, breathe, 
and ask yourself, what am I needing? Am I hungry or not? And that's the beginning of the journey to manage emotional eating, to just be aware of your needs. If you're hungry or if it's your meal time, you're supposed to eat because your body needs energy. But if what you're experiencing is an emotion, emotions are um, physical reactions, tensions that we experience in our body, then you don't need food. And what you need to do is to follow a process that I will teach you in a while, okay? But you're not needing to eat anything. And you are going to give yourself what you really need. Okay, so Brenda, how are we doing? Let me know, please. It looks like we're doing good here. I don't see any questions yet. It looks like we have lots of good comments. See what everybody, you know, guys. Um, what was it? what was the line last line on the last slide? Yeah, guys. Jill, also, turning to that slide, like to the table. Let me know if it was that that slide or another one. And two, I would I would say this is a great slide to take a screenshot or to take your camera and take a picture. I don't know if you can see my camera. Like take a picture of, of it because sometimes it's kind of hard to remember these things. Like I'm listening to you to you and some things that you say, I'm like, okay, what was that again? <laughs> because our minds, the way our minds think. Rodolfo, one question I did have is when we were talking about self-soothing, like as far as food. What was the wording that you used to describe the type of ability that you develop for this and the skill level? What was that called again? Self-regulation. Self-regulation. Okay. Yes, because, which is the capacity to regulate our emotions. Because actually emotions have a purpose. If you're experiencing anxiety, that's for a reason. If you're experiencing sadness, that's for a reason. So there's nothing wrong with the emotion. The emotion is there because it's letting you some, letting you know that you need something, right? So for example, maybe you're stressed because you are not sleeping enough and you're working a lot and you're not setting boundary. So the emotion is there to let you know that there are some needs that you're not satisfying, right? And what we're supposed to do is to detect those needs and then reduce the intensity level of the emotion and trans being able to move on to a different emotion. And that happens if we feel that we have a sense of control in the moment, right? So it's kind of like, I'm working a lot. Okay, I'm going to design a plan to be able to um, rest more hours or have time to relax, right? And with that, you will start reducing your stress levels with time, right? But sometimes we don't learn those skills. And we just think that if we cover the emotion or we turn to food, we're going to feel better but we are not seeing the big picture and that emotion, that stress is going to come back in the future because we are not tackling the root. Yeah. Some great comments coming in. By the Somebody chat, says, I, I even yeah. struggle with head hunger for healthier choices like cucumber or orange. I can't move on until I eat it. Um, Linda says, instead of disconnecting from the emotion by using food, we need to experience the emotion and deal with it. Is that correct or helpful statement? Like, would you say that it's it's better just to ignore it? Or is it better to actually connect with it and say, ask yourself, why am I feeling this way? and try to resolve it that way. I mean, so, when we, uh -huh. I was yeah. just gonna say, so distraction, like just ignoring it and letting it go away or dealing with it. Okay, love, I love that question. So you can distract yourself, but the emotion is emerging for a reason. And there's a need that you haven't satisfied. So distracting yourself is just going to be kind of like a short term band-aid. Because the next day, again, if you're stressed out because you don't know how to set boundaries, that stress is going to emerge again. And what are you going to do again? Like keep distracting? Like you can do that, 
but I think that is not sustainable in the long run. And also then if you keep working a lot of hours and you don't set the boundaries, then you will end up having a burnout. That's what is going to happen. So in other words, let's say you're eating, like you're eating some potato chips and you think, you feel like maybe a little bit of guilt or shame. So asking yourself, why do I feel this way? Why do I need this food kind of thing? So maybe you're you're wanting or needing it because you feel like you need salt or because you feel like you um, want something quick and easy to help regulate your blood sugar. Like, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Like but, asking yourself yeah, why and, you're doing it? And the first question, and then actually I'm loving this question, Brenda, because I think that this is taking us to the next uh content which is basically the steps that you need to follow actually when you are experiencing emotional eating but if your body is creating an emotion is for a reason and you need to understand why that's happening okay it's like if you're hungry that's for a reason your body needs sugar or needs full right fuel and that's why uh you're supposed to eat so basically, it's about learning how to connect with our bodies, connect to our needs, and then honoring those needs and taking action. That's how it is, okay? Um, and what I would like to do now, if possible, is to actually share the steps that you need to follow to tame emotional eating, which is where your question was pointing to. Yes, I think that's great. I think that's Excellent. wonderful. Okay, so steps to tame emotional eating. So if you're in this call and you struggle with emotional eating, I need your attention here because we will delve into these steps, okay? And I need you to be clear with the steps. So if you have questions, please let me know. Step number one, identify the physical sensations. So again, you will stop, count to 10, and then ask yourself, am I hungry? If you're hungry, you can go ahead and eat something because your body needs energy. So you will stick to your guidelines and have something, a snack, or if it's mealtime, you will eat what you're supposed to. But if you are not hungry, I want you to connect with your body and to the physical sensation that you are experiencing. And maybe you're experiencing a tension over your chest, maybe something in your stomach that is not hunger, it's a different reaction. Maybe a burden here over your back maybe something over your head, etc. That's the beginning of the journey to manage emotional eating. I need you to connect to your body. Why? Because what we want to do is to disconnect from the body and turn to food or do another activity or distract. And then with that, being able to overcome the emotion. The issue is that by doing so, we are not uh, satisfying our needs. We're not giving our, ourselves what we really need. And the only way we're going to do that is through connecting to the body, okay? So step number one, I need you to connect to the physical sensations. Now, step two, practice self-validation. What do I mean when I say self-validation? When we experience emotions, Emotions that we associate to negative emotions, such as anxiety, anger, frustration, boredom, etc. What we tend to do is to judge ourselves. So we tell ourselves, you know what, you're anxious again. Why? Why are you not able to manage your emotions? Now you are experiencing anxiety. You know how this will end up. You will turn to food, etc. That negative inner dialogue typically intensifies the intensity of the emotion. So what I need you to do is the following. Treat yourself in a gentle way and tell yourself, you know what? You're experiencing an emotion. That emotion is linked to a need. We need to identify what are you needing. So with that, you're validating that emotion and you're understanding that that emotion has a purpose. That's the second step. Instead of judging yourself, instead of having negative self-talk, which will intensify the emotion, I need you to say, you know what? This emotion is okay. It's emerging for a reason. I will tackle this emotion. I will approach this emotion. Am I being clear? Let me know by the chat, please. 
Thank you, Tommy. Laura, thank you. Lisa, excellent. Linda, okay. Great. Now, let's go. Let's move on to step number three. Identify your needs. Identify your needs. So, for example, let's say that um, I completed the step one and I was experiencing a pressure over my chest, okay? Which typically for me, that's how anxiety manifests. I completed the step number two and I told myself that it was okay to experience this emotion. This emotion had a purpose and I was going to explore what's the purpose of the emotion. And then step number three consists on identifying the needs that we are having. So for example, maybe, maybe this is an anxiety when I experience every time that I have to present at work. So I have to present and then I get anxious because I feel that um, I'm not good enough. People will ask me questions and I will not know how to respond. Maybe I think that I will have a bad performance. My, bo my, my boss is going to think that I'm doing a bad job. Those are the thoughts that I have, okay? So this anxiety is letting me know that I need to do a deeper work on self-confidence. And this work could consider managing my limiting thoughts, working with a counselor, working with a coach, working with a therapist, but there's something related to my self-confidence that I need to work on. And then I can ask for help and I can take action. Instead of every time that I'm experiencing this anxiety, automatically turning to food and eating. So identifying our needs help us because after identifying the need, we can create a plan of action and move forward and tackle the need. If you are not able to identify our needs, then the need is going to be there. It's going to be not satisfied and it will emerge in the future as an emotion. Let's say for example, that I struggle with insomnia and I don't sleep well. So maybe during the day, I am tired and I experience this sense of a burden. And maybe I turn to food as a way to disconnect from that emotion. Well, I have a need. I need to sleep extra hours. I need to incorporate healthy sleeping habits. I need to go to bed every day at the same time. I need to stop scrolling on my phone at night. So again, the emotion is letting me know that I have needs that I need to satisfy. And if you would like to be aware of the needs that you have, what you can do is explore Maslow's Pyramid, which classify the needs that we have as human beings and classify them in different levels. So if you notice, we have basic needs such as food, warmth, rest, water. Maybe we might need um, something psychologically. Uh, relationships, connection, in intimacy, accomplishing our goals, etc. And there are some needs related to self-fulfillment, such as, for example, um, practicing some hobbies, activities that we enjoy, spirituality, etc. Okay. Let me know by the chat if if you're following me. I would like to know. Perfect. Good. So Brenda, is there anything that you would like to add? And mute myself here. I don't think so, Rodolfo. I think you're, I think you're hitting. There's a, some questions that are coming up, but guy and guys keep asking those. We're gonna let Rodolfo keep going, but we are gonna try to hit as many questions as we can whenever we kind of get a little bit more through this, because we want to make sure he's able to hit everything. But we want to try to come back. Perfect. So, what you need to do sometimes to be able to satisfy your needs, because this is kind of like step four. Okay, so now it's like the moment in which um, you start tackling your needs to satisfy them. So maybe let's say that um, I'm stressed and that's an emotion that I experience constantly because I don't set boundaries. 
And maybe I don't set boundaries because I have the thought that I'm not important, that all others are more important than I, okay? What I need to do is to reframe my thoughts, which is top four. Sometimes we don't satisfy our needs because we have limiting beliefs or limiting thoughts. And those thoughts prevent us from taking action. Maybe I'm telling myself, and this is something that I've seen in people that struggle with chronic insomnia, like they tell themselves that they have a sleeping problem, that they struggle with insomnia. But then when it's nighttime, they start scrolling on their phones. <laughs> so actually that thought is the one that allows them to then follow some actions or behaviors that are the ones that generate the problem. So everything starts with our thoughts. Me, for example, I'm telling myself that I can't say no. I don't know how to set boundaries. Then it's likely that in my relationships, I'm going to feel a lack of confidence. I'm going to feel that I can't be honest. And given that, I'm not going to communicate my needs. And what's going to be the result? I will end up doing things for others, for example, that I don't want to do. And I will overextend myself and I will end up tired, stressed out with burnout. So if you want to satisfy your needs and then being able also to accomplish your results and your goals, it's important to understand the thoughts that you're having. And sometimes, unfortunately, our thoughts and mindset play against us. And that's why that's step four, right? Because again, if you want to take action and satisfy your needs, working on your thoughts, it's important. If I'm going to present and I'm telling myself that my boss will think that what I do is not enough, I will experience anxiety. Like there's no way. I need to work on my self-confidence, right? And that's a thought that I'm not enough, a thought that I need to work on and remove it. And I start incorporating other thoughts, such as, for example, I'm competent, I'm capable, I'm, uh, yeah. I have like the, the resources and the intelligence necessary to have the performance and I wish. And sometimes what I've seen in bariatric patients is that they have thoughts that are not aligned with their goals. So for example, sometimes they'll tell themselves something like, I will always struggle with my weight. When they experience regain, for example, they tell themselves, I made the wrong decision. This is not going to work. And unfortunately, those thoughts generate emotions such as frustration, anger, guilt, shame, which are emotions that then are the ones that make them not being motivated. They don't give, then they don't give their best. And given that, they keep indulging in habits that are not healthy. Does that make sense? Let me know by the chat, please. Perfect, excellent. So Brenda, um, I, I, I think that maybe we can open up a space for just questions or discussions because I think that I have shared a lot of information that is information that requires time to be digested. And maybe there are some things that for some people are not making sense. So again, my commitment is to create clarity. And maybe if our attendees have questions, we could open the space for that. What are your thoughts? What do you think, Brenda? I love that. Yes, Rodolfo. And it is, it is a lot to kind of take in, process, think about. Um, I'm looking back here because I thought I wanted to make sure and try to hit some of these. Um, how do you eat more food and less sweets? I have a very hard time eating food, but I'll eat sweets like snack cakes, muffins, please any advice. And I can relate to this because I know I get stuck in that, that same cue for myself. I know what I've done sometimes is substitute like if it's chocolate maybe eating a healthier form of that maybe like a chocolate sugar-free chocolate pudding or um mm -hmm. if it's crunch that you're wanting maybe potato chips maybe like a protein chip i don't know rodolfo do you have any suggestions for that i mean so okay so first of all in order to like uh follow the structure of the class before eating, you need to ask yourself if you're hungry or if it's your time to eat. And if you're not hungry and it's not your time to eat, you're not supposed to eat anything. You're not supposed to eat a jelly, a diet jelly with no calories. Like you're not supposed to have a diet Coke, which is kind of like the not sexy answer. I know. I know that what I'm saying is hard. 
but also is the work necessary for you to be able to understand better yourself? Okay, so this is kind of like tough love, I feel. But the beginning is to ask yourself, am I hungry? Or it's my meal time. And then if it's your meal time, yes, you can evaluate alternatives, right? Like maybe for example, for you, it's easier to uh, have things that are sweet. So maybe a yogurt can help you, like a Greek yogurt, or, 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 or you can explore different types of food, right? But I think that that's kind of after understanding that you're hungry and that your body needs energy. That's when I would do that. I yeah, love I that answer because you're going back to your teaching. It's not like if it's hunger, maybe if you don't feel good about your choices, obviously finding something that's going to satisfy that need. But if it's not physical hunger and it's boredom or stress or whatever. You don't need whatever. to eat anything. You don't need to eat anything. Okay. Yeah. And there was a question similar to that one. Not the same question, but similar. Someone was asking like, um, how can I distract myself? And he's like, wait, wait, wait. No. Like, if you're experiencing an emotion and the emotion is emerging, it's for a reason. So you don't need to distract yourself from the emotion and cover it walking or jumping or drinking water. Like, no, because if you do that, then the need is going to stay there and come back in the future as an emotion again. And probably with greater force. So the invitation <laughs> given the class is for you to be able to manage the emotion and understand the needs that you're having. That's the invitation. And again, I know that this answer is not kind of like the sexy answer, right? Like what people like to hear. Like sometimes we are used to listen to like the, the pill solution. Like, oh, do this and it's going to be fixed. In order to fix it, we need to do the hard work. And the hard work is to connect with emotions that maybe we have been running away during our whole life. And I'm talking about myself. Since I was a kid, I was running away from my anxiety. And that's why I struggle with my weight. And if I can go back and show you like the picture at the left, I, I was overweight. I was an overweight teenager. But at some point, I decided to confront the emotion and understand what I was experiencing that anxiety. And that anxiety, I promise you, had a reason. And it was related with a lack of self-esteem, a lack of self-love, a lack of acceptance, etc. And when I was willing to confront that, then I was able to process the emotion. And today I can say that my relationship with food is more balanced. I'm connected to my needs. Now, again, this is a work that lasts forever because once you have an attachment, it's likely too that if you experience the emotion, you will turn to food or like that's going to be a tendency. But also you have the tools to manage the emotion. Yeah. So Rodolfo, here's another one too. And this person is asking if you were going to seek help for emotion eating, would you go to a dietitian or a eating disorder therapist? My own take on that would be, um, I think when you're dealing with, it's not just the food that you're dealing with. If you're dealing with the choices to make, like nutrition wise, then the dietitian would be helpful. If you're dealing with the emotional stand part, stand, stand put part are the reasons that you're feeling the way you do and you need help with that a coach like Rodolfo or you know somebody who is able to deal with that and there is I know there's a website called bariatrictherapist.com which Ashlyn um is is kind of had head started that a lot of programs will have have therapists but do you have any other answers for that too as well so what I think is that in this community there are different experts there are therapists, there are coaches, right? Um, there are dietitians, etc. And for example, I'm sharing a method. And for some people, sticking to this method is not feasible. They try, for example, and the emotion emerges and like it takes over, right? So what's my invitation for you? To check if these tools, for example, are helpful. And with this level of awareness, you're kind of like, oh, this makes sense. I can start making changes. If this helps you and you feel that you can start making changes, this could be an alternative. Coaching, for example, right? But if not, maybe this emotional eating could be related to something deeper and then you might need additional help. That's my answer. I, I, I don't think that there's like one type of solution. I think that there are different solutions. And also I think that in this work, the relationship that you create with the expert also is important because if you connect with the expert and you, it's a person that you understand and also the things that says make sense and you feel safe, 
you're going to heal, right? And this expert can look in different ways. So, I mean, there, there's no one answer. And also it's going to depend on what you're needing and you feel that you need. Because for some people, this is enough. And for others, it's not, which is fine. Again, we are all in different journeys and we all need different tools also. I know, I know people that have worked with coaches and it hasn't helped them. Others that have worked with coaches then create value and it helped them, right? Some people that go for therapy and don't create value to them. So, so like, I think this is so personal. That, that's my, my feeling. There's not a one, one answer for everybody, you know? And exactly. there is a question. Um, there's a question on the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Somebody asked, do you need to meet each need before moving to the top? So, well, what the theory of Maslow says is that like in order to be able to satisfy the needs of the top, you need to be able to satisfy first the needs of the base, right? Like, for example, if you're trying to, if I'm trying to facilitate that workshop and then I haven't eaten, if I haven't eaten, um, yeah, eaten, it's going to be hard for me to pay attention and focus. So I need to first eat, sleep, be rest, and then I'm going to be able to facilitate the workshop, right? That's what the theory says, yes. For insomnia, how do you reframe your thoughts? Can you give an example? With CBT. So CBT. cognitive behavioral therapy? Yes. So yes. look that up or... Yeah, actually, there, like, there are there are CBT, CBT, sorry, methods to manage insomnia that exist that basically work on removing limiting thoughts and beliefs. Because what typically happens to someone that struggles with insomnia is that the ninth time comes and the person is start telling him or themselves that they will not be able to fall asleep. And that generates anxiety. And given that, they wake up and they are not able to sleep. So what they need to do is to manage uh, those thoughts. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We do have... Let me jump to some of the Q&A here because I know that there's several here. I was like reading through the comments. Um, and I know you guys were getting close to the six o'clock time frame. I want to say we're going to continue because there's some great questions. Are you okay with that, Rodolfo? We'll take yeah. we'll take maybe five or six more just to kind of stay somewhat in tune with um our time frame. But um I'm gonna so I'm gonna take a few more. It looks like Mayra says, or Myra says, I feel like I can control my eating and it also hunger hasn't increased, but I feel like I stopped losing weight. Um, what may I do to start losing weight again? So I feel like that's a multifaceted question, but do you have a suggestion? I mean, what I have seen in my clients is that sometimes they are in a stall and that's like a biological stall, right? Sometimes, and they don't lose weight um, for a while. And then after a while, sticking to the habits, the body kind of like reset itself and they continue losing weight. So you might be in that type of stall. So if you're sticking to your eating plan, then keep going. And if not, then see your dietitian or physician to ask for help because maybe you need an adjustment. Now, one of the things that I've seen is that my clients tell themselves that they are doing everything, but then when we confront what they are doing, it's not what they are supposed to. And that's what is not making them lose weight. So also it's important to check that you are following everything 100% in the way that you're supposed to. And sometimes consistency is hard when you don't see immediate results, that reward. So like sometimes there might be four weeks go by, there may be two months go by and you don't see anything. So, you know, going back to the basics and like looking at that, I think that's a great answer. Being honest with yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's one. Megan says, "Do you have any substitutes for ice cream and snacks?" I know for ice cream there is a ah uh, the cream. It's called creamy, creamy or something like that. It's like a frozen um, ice cream maker, but you can use it with protein shakes. I've heard a lot of people do that. Um, as far as other snakes snacks, we actually have on our our page, which I'll show you guys here in a little bit, a bunch of other substitutes. I think um, 
It's called Food sw Swaps That Taste, Taste So Good. Have a bunch of swaps. Um, Rodolfo, any suggestions there on your end? I have my not sexy answer. Again, like if you are not hungry, you're not supposed to eat or if it's not your meal time. And I'm bringing this up because I think that this is something that we need to incorporate because we're so programmed to just like think about food without first asking ourselves if we need that food, right? So again, I think that your answer is excellent. Also, I think that you can like replace it with yogurt or make ice cream with yogurt, right? That can help too. But first I would ask yourself if you're hungry. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you keep coming back. You keep bringing us back in. You keep bringing us back in. Um, how can you eat when you are full or not? I'm going to say also not hungry because that's, you know, like if your body physically needs food, but you're not hungry and you don't feel like eating. Yeah. So remember what I said about cravings? So, and how to transform the cravings, like uh, transforming our perception, we can do the same to create a craving if we don't want to eat, right? Basically, stimulate ourselves. So, we start thinking about food and imagining ourselves enjoying the food, etc. And that's going to start generating desire for eating. Yeah. So, it's kind of like using the technique, but like to the other side, you know, on an okay. opposite direction. Yeah. Um, okay, Sarah says, I'm taking, I'm taking two more here, guys. I know we have like, looks like 50 some more comments, but um, Sarah says, what is a good way to create an exercise habit? Oh, um, rewards, gratifications. Like, for example, if you walk, walk with someone. If you go to the gym, watch your show uh, on the treadmill. Um, while you are practicing the exercise, like um, adding at the same time or incorporate something that provides pleasure that's going to help yeah okay i'm taking one more i'm just looking through okay I think a lot of these are just just commenting on all of this. I'm gonna go ahead, Rodolfo, and just turn it over to you to do a uh, little summary real quickly, and then also how they can get a hold of you if they're interested yeah. in because right. you actually work one on one with clients, and it's a great way to facilitate someone who maybe is hard. It's hard to get out of your own mind sometimes. Sometimes I I have a hard time reaching out for help with other people, but I found this last year. I reached out to get help with my own weight loss journey to, because I felt like I had been the same for a while and I was having a difficulty stepping out of that. So, so in doing that, I have been able to get back to my goal weight. I lost about 35 pounds and also starting an exercise routine, which um, working with the trainers. So for me, that, that has helped me to give us some, let us know how, how people can work with you if they're interested yeah, so as I said uh, during the presentation, I have a Taming Emotional Eating program. Um, I know that the presentation had a lot of content, and some of the things that we have discussed here are things that sometimes logically people understand, but sometimes they find themselves in the situation when the emotion is emerging, etc., and they don't know how to move forward. So if you would like to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, um, I would love to meet you, learn more about what are your challenges, and also check if we are a good fit. And what I will do is to share by the chat a link to my calendar, okay? Um, and that's going to redirect you to my calendar, and you will be able to schedule a consultation with me. What's a consultation? Basically, we're going to meet, and we will start working. <laughs> and you will have the experience of what it means to work with me. And then after that, if it makes sense, we can figure out next steps and I can explain how my program works, et cetera. But everything starts with a consultation. Like I always tell my clients, like the best way to learn if we're a good fit for each other and if I'm going to help you is just scheduling the consultation, working with me, um, and then checking if it makes sense to move forward. Um, the consultation is for free. 
So you can just click on that link and you will be able to scale that time working with me. Um, and in the program that I have for taming emotional eating, the person is able to learn this skill, which is the one that we discovered during the class, which is self-regulation. Basically being able to connect to your needs, to your emotions, and then taking action and managing the emotion in an alternative way, which is not eating something. And again, nobody teaches us how to regulate ourselves. If you're struggling with emotional eating, uh, that's something that people struggle with and people manage their emotion in different ways. And maybe in your case, you learn to manage your emotions through food. Others manage them, turning to their phones, working on social media, drinking, etc. cetera. Um, and there's a lot of work related to connecting to this body that we don't want to connect and feel ourselves and understand why this emotion is emerging, which might be related with some limiting beliefs and limiting thoughts. So if you would be interested in working with me, please schedule um, that consultation. Thanks, Rodolfo. Appreciate you sharing that. And I'll show you guys how to find that here in a second, too. I put in the chat box Rodolfo's email, his Instagram, and his um, redid his discovery call link once more. He had placed it in there as well. Um, Rodolfo, I'm going to be sharing some things, too, from our sponsor. Um, yeah. Are you okay with that? Or did you have anything else that you wanted to say before we do that? Yeah, I forgot to say that um, if you are in the community also and you're an expert and you would like to help others with a program and create your programs, um, that's something that I'm also doing right now, helping experts to articulate a program to help others. So if you're a coach, a dietitian, a nurse, or someone that is an expert on a topic that would like to support bariatric patients, reach out to me and I'll be glad to explain how my program to create programs work. Um, and you can schedule a consultation too. We can meet and check if we can work together. Yeah, that's my, the last thing that I wanted to say, Brenda. Oh, I love that. No, I, I appreciate that. And there is a comment in the um, Q&A box, um, Rodolfo. Um, somebody's asking about books and workbooks to recommend for emotional eating. Is there anything that you that you can say to that? Yes. Here I have one of my favorite books. It's called When Food is Comfort? Yes. Yeah. I love this book. Who's that guy? Karen, I use a lot of CBT in my program. Who's which that is written by Rodolfo? Managing the Thoughts. What? Sorry? Who is that written by? Oh, um, Julie M. Simon. I don't know okay, if you I'm can. I'm typing that in. The... I hope I spelled it right. That's great. Yeah. Tammy is in the chat now. Brenda um, added it. Let me know if I spelled it incorrectly or anything like that, Rodolfo. Hopefully I, I had it right. And so I'm going to kind of share my screen here real quick too, Rodolfo, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm sharing. Yes, go okay. ahead. Let's see here. It's taking me just a second. And okay. Have everything pulled up here for you guys. Um, and so I just want to say ProCare Health is a bariatric supplement and vitamin company. They're sponsoring our event today. They're sponsoring all these wonderful events that we've been doing for you guys. Um, what they're known for is being one of the, the least expensive bariatric vitamins out on the market. Right now, we actually have um, a little promotion going, and I'm going to kind of mention that. It's Orange and Lemon Day. Uh, my screen's going to kind of keep popping off. You get a free 30 count lemon drop calcium with the purchase of one of our new citrus grove tablets, which is our new multivitamin. You guys, this multivitamin has been life changing for me. I am not going to lie. I have struggled with vitamins, like taking vitamins, even our ProCare vitamins for whatever reason, everybody's bodies are different. And I, the other vitamin that I can usually take is our vitamin chewable. Um, those two set well with me, but this is brand new. Um, I will put more information in the chat box on this little promotion. It's available today through the 24th and, um, I'll put that here. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second and I'll, um, put that information in here in the chat. And then I'll also, um, share a few more things that I promised that I would share. Okay copying that and I'm going to do a quick paste and then I'll go back. 
It's a lot of information there. And so thanks for being patient with me guys here. Okay. Share screen once more. And here we go. So the multivitamin, um, you can find it under products, bariatric multivitamin. I also included the link in the chat box. If you are listening to the replay, you can find this in the description section of this event, um, whether you're on the podcast or just listening on YouTube. So we have the multivitamin and then we also have our calcium. If you go into our calcium supplements, you'll find, I actually have it just pulled up here to make it easy. Um, the calcium and it's a lemon drop. It's a mocktail flavor of the drink. Lemon drop does not have any alcohol in it. And these are made with all natural flavors. Our calcium are and um, are really smooth. No artificial sweeteners, no sh sugar alcohols. Um, each of them are wrapped individually. And they have 500 milligrams of calcium and 500 IU of vitamin D. So that's one thing I wanted to say. We also have just started offering a price match um, which our price match is basically just, is basically a way to get your vitamins at, at least the same price, if not lower than other companies. So if you decide you want to price match with something, all you have to do is chat with one of our representatives. If you go to our website where, um, when you go there, there's a little chat box and you can chat with one of our individuals or there's a phone number at the top of our website right up here. Call us. You can um, call one of our staff and let us know if there's something you want to price match. So right here at the bottom and then also up here at the top. Also, I mentioned here under this very connected tab, you guys, this is where you can find all of these events like the one we did with Rodolfo. Rodolfo, we're doing another event next month. You guys loved Rodolfo. He's going to be back with us talking about love and relationships. So each month, if you click on Very Connected tab at the top of the ProCareNow.com website, you're going to go down and you're going to find all of the events for each month and you can register. Now, each event is on replay until the end of the month. So Stephanie joined us, Stephanie Mitchell, and we... Um, did two classes of part one and part two on meal prep. And then we also had um, my friend, Dr. Brian Grossman on talking about mindset. This has been a mindset month. Um, so all of those are on replay. Next week, we'll have Jennifer here. Um, sorry, Jen here. And she's going to be talking about macros and calories for sustainable weight loss. Rodolfo's session will be on replay till the end of the month. We also put all of our replays onto our podcast and our YouTube station. So you can go to any of the major podcasts and go to Very Connected and like Spotify or iHeartRadio, whatever. And those will be on. This this is will be added by next Tuesday. So mm -hmm. everything is always added the week, week after. Um, but you can use the same link to listen to the replay right now as well. If you want to kind of go back, sometimes things like this that are deep and you, there's a lot of content in it, Rodolfo, it's helpful to go back and listen. Um, also on our Facebook page, we have a very connected Facebook page and a Facebook group, which I'll show you guys. And I'll also show you our YouTube channel. So you can click on any of those links. It'll bring you to these um, ProCare Health Vitamins and Supplements is our YouTube. If you follow us, there should be a follow button. You subscribe. Um, you can get access as soon as something comes out, usually get a notification. So we have over 240 videos on there of all different kinds of replays of different events that we've had. Um, so that's one way to kind of follow us and get updates. Another way is these very connected. Um, here is our very connected group. So after these events, if you want to connect with other bariatric surgery patients, one way to do it in our page, which is called Barry Connect. Um, Rodolfo and I are also part of an amazing group called Berry Nation. Shout out to Berry Nation people. If you're still here on the call with us, let us know. Um, we're part of that group. I also just want to say on the ProCare website, if you go to the main page and go under Berry Connected um, tab, there is a little tab that says partner programs. And Barry Connected is a partner program. Rodolfo has classes in there all the time. It's a great way to connect with him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, besides his coaching. And so learn more about that on our partner program page. Yeah, I love Barry Nation. Yeah. Thank you all for staying with us. 
Yes, thanks for joining us. And also thanks for being open to listen to um, some uncomfortable answers that I have for you. No <laughs> sexy answers, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there was a question, HSA. Yes, I mean, if you turn in your, like, I don't know how exactly HSA, all, all of them work, but um, I do know patients that have turned that into their HSA to get reimbursement. I don't know if you have to have a doctor's write an order for that even though it's not prescription, um, I would check deeper into it because I do know people are using that for their um, health sharing accounts. Um, we have several Berry Nation people here. Hello. There is, uh, this will be on replay. If you go and click the same link that you click to register for this event, it will be on demand until the end of this month. And again, on replay by next Tuesday on YouTube and the Berry Connected podcast. Um, was there something else, Rodolfo? Did I miss any other questions? I don't think. No. Okay. Yes. So I think we've got most of them. I apologize. I'm going to actually put my email too, if anybody has any questions. One thing I do want to mention, some people attend these support groups as part of, of their um, pre-authorization for surgery. They need to attend so many support groups. If that is you and your facility is, um, I have over 50 facilities now that are uh, enrolled in attendance for these. And so I send the attendance along with the agenda and all the information regarding participants who said that they would, I could share their information. Um, I will be doing that next Tuesday to help keep in, make sure I get all the replays in with that. Um, but if you have a reason that you want to reach out to me individually, if you don't think your facility is in that, you're welcome to email me. It's my last name, Hain, H-O-E-H-N, B at pokernow.com. So I think that's everything. We love you all. Have a great weekend. And if anybody is in New Jersey, um, I am here right now. I just got here today and I'm traveling in for the Bariatric Society is having a little event in Edison, New Jersey at Top Golf and also a workout gym um, Saturday. So uh, email me, let me know that you're here and I'll come and connect with you. I'd love that. And Rodolfo, anything that you want to say to add to that before we jump off? Just thank you for inviting me. Uh, to join you today. It was a pleasure. I love working with you and being here. So thanks. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I love you too. And excited because we're going to have you back next month. So be watching that hub page because Rodolfo will be back and his will be posted as of April 1st. You'll see his new, um, that new one to register for because you always have to register for these. So thank you. And everybody have a great weekend. Take care. Moving. Bye.